I'm coming back. And I ain't coming back limping. I'm coming back stronger than I've ever been before. And because I need to be a sign and a wonder for you and for all of you that are watching, that you need to realize you may be struck down, but you're not destroyed. I'm not destroyed. I've got a blessed thing because i got a second chance at life. It's time for The Word with Pastor Tim Rigdon with The Well. This is a church digging a wellspring of revival in rural America. This is a place where you come as you are. You won't leave the same. Now, here is Pastor Tim Rigdon with today's message here on Sermons from the Well. I want to talk to you today about being filled and sealed. Amen. Filled and sealed. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 7 says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the Lord, same. Arise and go down to the potter's house, for there I will cause you to hear my words. Amen. It says, Then I went down to the potter's house, and there was there he was, making something at a wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Amen. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do this unto you as the potter has done? Can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Amen? The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, or to destroy. Amen? So, in other words, the potter was making a vessel. How many knows that each one of us are a vessel of and if you've been born again, you you have the, the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and He's poured it into you. Amen? <clears throat> Praise God. And there's something about vessels, and we're going to study a little bit about vessels here this morning before we get going uh, totally into this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. <clears throat> And I found out that in church, there's many kinds of vessels. Amen? Vessels that have giftings, vessels that maybe have talents, but also vessels that, you know, the greatest gift that you could give a church is not your gift or your talent, but the greatest gift you can give is your availability. Amen? <clears throat> and your faithfulness. Amen? Faithfulness. God is faithful. And we're to be more like Him. God is faithful. We want to be faithful to Him. Amen? Praise God. And he says, but in a great house, there are, all, there are not only vessels of gold and silver. In other words, there's not only these fancy vessels, vessels, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some, some for dishonor. And notice that he doesn't say the gold and silver are for honor and the wood and the clay are for dishonor. He doesn't make a distinction. I believe there are both. I believe that there are Gold vessels and silver, wood and clay that are of honor. And there's gold and silver and wood and clay vessels that are for dishonor. Because in a church, we've got people that, you know, they may look like they may, they're made of gold or silver. And some are made of wood and clay. But it doesn't matter what we're made of. It's what's on the inside. Amen. That's why we don't judge the vessel. Amen. It's what's on the inside. Verse 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. <clears throat> Meet for the master's use, as one version says. Here's the thing. So he says, if you sanctify yourself, and you can be useful. In other words, you can be a vessel of honor. So it doesn't matter if you're made of that gold or silver or the clay or the wood. What matters is, have you been given your heart over to the Lord? Amen. Praise God. And that's what God's trying to get around to us. Uh, to get, get through to us. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 4. Now, today's message, I'm reading you about a, a lot of scripture, but it's about vessels. And I've got, and some of you seen it last week, but it's still, it's, it's a powerful illustration, I think. It says, flee off so youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who are call, who call upon the, the Lord out of a pure heart. Amen. Those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Amen. It says, but we have this treasure. Everybody say this treasure. 
in earthen vessels. How do we know we're earthen vessels? Because God made man from the dirt of the earth. He made Adam, remember? Remember, he took the clay and he breathed his breath into him, and, it became, and that became that earthen vessel. Amen. It says that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. Amen. I think sometimes when God starts using some people, they begin to think it's them instead of the God in them. Amen. And so uh, God, I believe, uses earthen vessels, in other words, plain Jane earthen vessels, uh, hallelujah, so he can get the glory so we know it's not that person, it's what's inside of them. Amen. It's what we're carrying. It's like I, I got, got through preaching this Ben's conference this past week, and I had this guy come to me and goes, man, I tell you what, that was an awesome message. I, was, I, said, I said, well, it was the Lord. If there's anything good in it, it was him. <clears throat> and uh, he said, no, I felt the anointing the whole time. I said, well, praise God. I said, I'm just a donkey he rode in on today. I said, tomorrow he's going to strap on another donkey called Bishop Camp, Bishop Barry Camp. <laughs> he's going to be speaking tomorrow. And I said, he'll ride in on him tomorrow. I said, Today, tonight, it was my night for him to ride in on. And, and I, that's the thing that we got to realize is the power may be of God and not of us. <clears throat> not of us. Not of us. Amen. Because when you begin to, I heard, I, I've heard people say this through the years, and I know they don't mean this. But don't do this, okay? Don't do what I'm about to say. Don't say, my anointing is this or my anointing is that because it ain't your anointing. It's his. <clears throat> don't say, well, I did this and I did that. You didn't do nothing. It was God through you that did something. Amen? <clears throat> if there be any good, any just, a pure, good report, think upon these things, he said. And that's the thing. He said, unless Jesus builds a house, they labor in vain. And so... You know, we can say, well, we did this, and I helped build the church, or I helped this, or I helped it. No, 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 no. It was Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> if you don't give him the glory for it, amen. Praise the Lord. Anyway, hallelujah. Look here. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. I love how Paul is writing this. And I, and I got to thinking about vessels, how, how different vessels can take different pressure, can't they? You know, it's according to what, what's inside it. It can take more pressure. He said, we're pressed on every side and not crushed. Does that not sound familiar to a lot of you right now, what you've been going through? I feel pressed on every side, but yet I'm still here, so therefore I'm not crushed. Amen? You're still here, so you're not crushed yet. And it says, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. <laughs> See, that's what the enemy wants to get you. He wants you to get to thinking and feeling sorry for yourself and say, I'm pressed on every side because when you start feeling sorry for yourself, the next stage is to be crushed. I'm telling you, I'm just warning you. It says, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. The enemy wants to get so many things you press on, so many sides, that he wants you to get you in despair. What's despair? Dis despair, another word for despair would be hopelessness. Hopelessness. And see, if you're in a circumstance and you don't see no hope, how many knows that Proverbs, the Bible still says, hope deferred, or in other words, hope put off, makes the heart sick. And so sometimes what we're hoping to happen doesn't happen the way we want it to be, then it makes our heart sick, and all of a sudden we can't get in despair. Even though everything's coming against us, even though there may be something around about us and we feel like we're about to be crushed under the pressure of the enemy. <clears throat> Let me tell you one thing about pressure. This is coal mining country, okay? And I'm not any expert in coal mining by any means. I've been down in several coal mines. I know Johnny May took me down in one, one time, and I was just like, that's the last one I'm going in. Because <laughs> it had this elevator, and, man, it went way down. I can remember... I said, are there not any sides on this elevator? He said, there's that chain around it. <laughs> and I'm like, and I seen just the wall of the coal mine. And go, it was freaking me out, okay? I was trying to be a man of faith, you know. <clears throat> Johnny's wanting to show me where he was. And I'm like, Ooh. I was binding up a lot of fears in my heart because heights don't bother me. I'll get in an airplane. I'll get on top of a tree, you know. But going down, <clears throat> nah. I'll let y'all do that, guys. <laughs> Amen. I remember doing that. And then I also remember one time uh, they had a bunch of accidents in one. And, and Claudia Osbrook took me down one. It had a slope. I rode down the slope. 
and this is right after a Sunday morning service, I had on my uh, back some pair of dress pants and dress shoes, and he took me to a coal mine. Amen? And I got, and when we got down there, it was nothing but mud at that first where we was getting off at because the rain had been going down the slope. <laughs> and uh, they've been having some accidents happen at this coal mine. A lot of equipment malfunctioning and people getting, not any major, I mean, killing or nothing like that. But <laughs> he said, <clears throat> I asked my boss, and he said it was okay, and he said, if you would do it. And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to go down to coal mine and anoint all the, all the equipment. So I went down and prayed in that coal mine and anointed everything. <laughs> I don't even remember what coal mine it was. It was I think it was out toward uh, Clay. <clears throat> but anyway, I went out there, and I can remember it was freaking me out. And I said, I'm supposed to be a man of prayer. I'm supposed to be a man of faith because I'm fixing to lay hands on all this equipment, and I'm freaking out right now on the inside. Especially when I got, listen, Johnny's, Johnny taught me something about coal mining, though. How coal miners walk in a coal mine. <clears throat> they look like speed skaters. You, a coal, you that ever been in a coal miner, you know this. But <clears throat> he turned around to me with his headlight, and he said, said, you better walk like this or your back will be hurting when you get out of here. I said, see, I was doing this. <clears throat> that ain't how they do it. They, they put their hands back here, and they go, I remember, John, <laughs> and you better have a helmet on because that bolt stick. <laughs> but anyway, he took me down through there, and it finally it opened up a little bit and stuff. But I remember getting in there with Claudia, and I'm like, I'll just pray from here, Claude, because <laughs> it was, <clears throat> I would have to crawl. And I said, I said, y'all go back in there and work every day? And he was, yep. I said, I'll pray from here, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> because I mean, so I give it to it. Now, why am I talking about coal mines? Because coal, if you crush it and you put enough pressure on it for a long time, it turns into what? A diamond. Amen? I believe that there are jewels or diamonds inside of each and every one of you, and what you're going through is just to reveal what God's plan is in for your life. That what may look like coal and what may look like pressure and what may look like blackness and darkness and, and all these things, God's making something out of the what Satan meant for evil, God's turned it for his good and his glory. Amen? What you thought was your end, what you thought and fear had come upon you just as it tried to come upon me as I went down in these coal mines, hallelujah, that all of a sudden faith is arising, realizing God's not done with me yet. So what I'm going through is what you see right now, it ain't much, but glory to God, when he comes back, I'm going to be like you. Yeah. Amen. We're just diamonds in the rough right now, church. Amen. We're crushed. We got pressure, hard pressed on every side, and we're not crushed. We're perplexed, and we're not in despair. That's because we know, if you know the process, amen. if you know it's a process, I told them this week, weekend down at the men's conference, and I spoke this out to y'all, and I spoke it over my own life, but I want you to hear this again. This is not your last chapter. This is not the last chapter. God's got many more he wants to write about in your life, Amen. And if I know this is not the last chapter, and I know that this is part of God's His plan, part of God's process, <clears throat> so it's like this. On the day of Pentecost, He said He poured out, and it, uh, in some version He talks about it, it says, poured out His Spirit, but He says it, He gave us new wine. Did He not? How many knows, and I, I got to think about this one day. <clears throat> How come old wine has more value than new wine? Did God give us something of less value because he gave us new wine? No, God gave us something that started a process that's going to grow in value. Not that it's reached its value already, but he's done something in each one of our lives when he's poured out his spirit inside of us that's going to grow inside of us because God is about the process. We're about instantaneous. We're about everything happening right now. <laughs> But God loves the process. The process of the pressure creating a jewel that's worth something. Because how many knows a handful of coal is worth something? But it ain't worth near as much 
is that diamond that he's making inside it. Amen? So he's doing a process in our lives that he can bring forth something that's of value. Yeah, we got value in our lives right now. If we weren't valuable, Jesus would not have came and died for us. If God didn't see something in your life and in my life and in those watching in your lives, he wouldn't have sent his only begotten son. He gave the best that heaven had to offer. Amen. Because you have value in your life. It says, uh, Romans 8, uh, 5, 8 says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I was still a sinner. I mean, long before I was even thought of by anybody. Amen. Jesus died for me. And he died for you. That's because you got value. And this hard pressing on every side, you say, God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? Why? Because he's trying to do a process in you. Amen. He's doing a process that he can get something out of it. <clears throat> I hear people say, well, I just want the anointing to be used of God. Amen. You know how anointing oil comes about? <clears throat> Think about it. We do, we, we do this oil. It's when they crush it. When you crush the olive, until it's been crushed, it won't release what's on the inside of it. It has to be pressed. It has to be crushed. It has to go through the process. <clears throat> and then that process to release it. And we got this great thing. It's anointing all that, that, like I said, that we had so much of it. We was pouring it on our hands and slapping it on and smearing it. <clears throat> but here's the thing. It first took the crushing. It took the crushing. crushing. <clears throat> and I don't know about y'all, but I, I haven't ever seen it. I've seen them pictures of them uh, on the grapes and they got a bunch of people out there and they've got their britches legs and their dresses hiked up and they're barefoot and they're squashing okay i think about i don't know if they do all of that way but i remember as a kid uh, both my grandparents but especially my grandparent my grandfather henson he had an apple orchard up in the mountains and some of y'all i've took you i showed you the, it's called hunger creek in crusoe north carolina and here i remember that he had this is like a I don't know if it's made out of cedar or what, but it, but it looked like this big bucket, you know, wooden bucket thing. And on top of it, it had a big crank. And what he would do is we would pile apples down in that, and then he'd start spinning that around, and then we'd all start, and he'd start pressing them apples, and they had a little spout come out the side, and that's where we got our apple cider. <clears throat> but it wasn't until they was crushed and pressed down and strained, yes. That's the way God's doing is a process in us. That it feels like we're being crushed and pressed down. But God ain't done. If you thought this is the end or the final chapter, then you could get in despair or you could be perplexed or all these different things. You could feel that way. But God's not done. He's just started a process because he knows your beginning, but he also knows your end. He's the Alpha and the Omega, amen? He didn't just say he was the Alpha. He's both. And so if you're going through something, now I'm not saying this word I'm preaching today is going to cause everything to change. It's not. But if you can understand why you're going through the process, that God sees value in you that could be even greater, that he wants to release an anointing out of you, that he wants to form a diamond in your life, that you could be a jewel, that you could be sought after, Hallelujah. then you can begin to accept things. Says, I know I'm in. See, most of the people, when you start going through a bunch of stuff, you think, well, I must be out of God's will. <clears throat> now, if you check your heart, I mean, that, that's the first thing we need to do is check our heart that I'm in the will of the Lord. Because sometimes we are out of the will. It said, those he loves, he chastises. Amen. But at the same time, I believe it's not necessarily people being out of the will of God. It's them being dead flat in the middle of God's will. Amen. Now, that don't make you shout. But I'm telling you, when this process is over with, it does not yet appear what you shall be. But when he returns, you're going to be like Jesus. Amen. But it's a process. It's a process. See, we don't like the process. We didn't like the process so much that I remember uh, when I was 
in high school, I think it was, we got a microwave oven. It wasn't like a microwave now. I mean, they were expensive and they were big. I mean, it, it was about as big as an oven, even though it didn't have that much room on the inside of it. <laughs> Amen. But I remember the first microwave we got. You know, and I remember it's like we was toting some, a piece of appliance in. You know, now you can have one under each arm and just go and set them there. But what I'm saying is we created that or man created that because, guess what? Boiling something just wasn't fast enough. Baking something was not fast enough. Frying something was not fast enough. So we had to get something that would be instantaneous within a minute or two. Amen? And they've ever tried to improve that, that it's getting faster and faster and faster, and you're getting more and more stuff that's instantaneous. Why? Because we don't like the process. We don't like the wait. But I'm going to tell you all something. Hallelujah. Brother Gary's back here. Him and Leanne came to see us today. And we were talking about food and stuff. Uh, he will tell you that when you start cooking some, some things, you got to let them sit there a while. Because it's the length of time you're letting it sit there and cook and simmer down that it gets a deeper, richer, thicker, or whatever, richer flavor to it that you can't get from a microwave. Amen. There's some things that God that you're going to cook that you can't get just like that. You've got to go through the process. Amen. You've got to boil it down or reduce it. As a, uh, if I've watched Food Network enough, <laughs> reduce it down to where there's something there. Amen. Well, see, that's because don't you think that whatever they're cooking, that soup, that roux, that whatever, that that's going to be better than something you could cook in the microwave? And yet, yet we're still complaining to God. God, why ain't you done it now? Now, now, now. I want it now. But God says, I've got something that's going to taste a lot better if you'll just wait. Because the Bible says, taste and see if the Lord is good. Amen. There's something greater that he's trying to do, not only to you, but through you. And he's trying to make you a vessel of honor. He's trying to make me a vessel of honor. But we've got to go through the process. We don't like the process because we murmur and complain because we got too much of the children of Israel still in us. we got too much Egypt in us still. See, it just wasn't about him getting the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was about him getting the Egypt out of the children of Israel. Amen. That mentality, that mentality that I want it now. <clears throat> Did you realize that they could have been in the promised land within two weeks? In two weeks, I think it's even 10 days walk. 11 days, 11 days they, they could have been there. But it took them 40 years. <clears throat> and so I began to pray about that and look at that years ago. And I realized that Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, he was tempted by the enemy. He had just been baptized uh, in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 3, he's tempted by Satan. Satan shows up and says, if you'd really be the son of God. Amen. In other words, Satan was coming to tempt him not to turn stones to bread, but he was tempting him. Are you truly the son of God? He was tempting him on his identity. I'm going to get this. He's a tent, and see that he still does that to you. He does that to me. If you're really the anointed of God, if you're really a child of God, then why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? And why are you allowing this? And why? See, the enemy wants to come in and wants you to question your salvation, wants to question why I'm this or why I'm that. Because Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, it said that he was being baptized by John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist was down there at the River Jordan and baptized. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that washes away the sins of this world. And uh, Jesus came down and said, John baptized me. He said, he said, Jesus, I'm not worthy to even untie your shoes. He said, Yeah, but you've got to baptize me. And it said when he baptized him, when he stuck him under the water, that a dove ascended from heaven and a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. In other words, he received his beloved identity on earth because he got a prophetic word from his father in heaven. This is my son. How many knows that as soon as you get a prophetic word, sometimes the fowls of the air try to come and gnaw it, and, and gnaw it up and, and tear it down and say, who do you think you are? 
Who do you really think you are? You think you're really going to do this or you're really going to do that? I mean, I know you received that prophetic word that God was going to do this through you. But who do you think you are? See, immediately it said that he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. So we, that, we don't want to shout about that, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. He was led by the Spirit. And if you look at that in Scripture and you check me out, which I want you to, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it, it's a capital S, which means a person, personal pronoun, which is a person, place, or thing. In other words, he's saying the Spirit. And see, any time the, the Word of God is speaking about a spirit, it's a lowercase s. But anytime he's talking about the Holy Spirit, it's a capital S because it's a person place. It's a personal pronoun. Okay? So there's a capital S right there. He was led by the Spirit, which means the Spirit of God, to the wilderness. What? I thought I'd get saved and then everything would be okay. God would take care of everything. It ain't that. He never once promised you that. <laughs> I don't know who sang this old country song, but I'm going to get it out of my brain because it's there. I'm just that way. <laughs> uh, you remember that old song? My wife can probably tell me. I beg your pardon. I never promised you. A ro- God never promised us that we wouldn't have problems in this world. See, some people bought it. Some people run to Jesus because they think he's going to fix all my problems. Yes, he is. But he's going to take a process to do it. Because you didn't get there overnight. Amen. We got there because we made some mistakes or wrong decisions in our lives. <clears throat> oh, I, it's just me. Y'all are perfect. Let me tell you something. We don't do everything right. And when we don't do everything, there's a repercussion for our actions. And so all of a sudden, Jesus is being baptized. He had a, a voice from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then immediately he's led by the Spirit of God to the wilderness, to a barren place. And he said there he was tempted. Amen. Didn't say he fell into temptation, but he was tempted. And he was tempted in all ways common to man. Amen. And the way he was tempted, three times he said, if you be the Son of God. He never, the temptation was not to turn stones to bread the temptation was not to cast himself down from a temple. The, those were not temptations. Everything, every time he tempted, he said, if you really be the Son of God. In other words, if you're really what everybody, the 5,000 or whatever, 1,000 people that were gathered at the river heard this voice, if you're really what that voice said you are, then do this. And so you will be tempted when you get born again or when you're trying to do something for God, you'll be tempted, just as Jesus was, in your identity to go and be somebody. Because, And I've had people say, say, well, this is my identity. No, that's your old identity. Because when you were born again, he said, old things have passed away. All right? We've got this nice word, the way we use it. And Peachy can help me out here because he's a... He's a deputy coroner and runs a funeral home. When someone has died, we usually say they've what? Passed. They've passed. See, because we don't want to use that other word. They've passed. They passed away. Okay? What does the scripture say? Old things, or this old man of mine, when I was born again, has what? In other words, he's dead. He's died. <clears throat> My thing is this. And and it's not my thing, it's God's thing, it's in the Word. If you haven't died out to your old self, then you ain't born again. You may have been in church every day since then. You may have done all these things, but if you haven't died out or passed away to your old sin, you are not mine. You say, well, Pastor, you're judging my salvation. I'm not judging. The Word of God judges that old things shall pass away. They shall die. Behold, everything's got to become new. That's the reason he said you need to be born again. You need to be born again. And when he said that, people said, well, we're supposed to go back into our mama's belly. And he said, No. So this is the spirit realm. Now, let me ask you something. And let me tell you something, not ask you. I've been born again for a lot of years now. But here's the thing. Does that old man try to resurrect himself inside of me? Yes. 
He tries to rise up. There are times that the enemy will try to throw enough stuff on me to try to get me to resurrect that, that old person that I do something or I say something like my old person would do. Amen? You know when that happens? I ain't got to get saved again. But you know what I do have to do? Lord, forgive me. I got to I got to I got to repent and I got to crucify fresh and new this flesh, this old man. <clears throat> I named mine Fred. I did years ago. That's the reason when I I, I mean I can feel my blood pressure going up sometimes in my face. I get <clears throat> I get angry or whatever and uh, I have to say to myself, Fred, you did. Fred, you did. You, you don't don't go there. Don't be that. <clears throat> That ain't who you are no more because that person has passed away. Amen. Behold, all things have become new. So if things aren't new around about you, I didn't say that you're not facing the same old, same old. What I said, that inside of you has got to pass away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. That's why we're crushed and, we're, and we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're not hopeless. We're not hopeless. Amen? Look at this next verse. i got to get on there. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. Matter of fact, it says if a good man falls, he gets back up again. How many times? Seven times. I can't do it holding everything. Seven times a good man. And you say, well, I'm not a good man or I'm not a good one man or whatever. No, there's no good inside of us, but the Jesus inside of us is good. I'm going to make a statement to you that it's either going to liberate you or put your mind on tilt. Okay, are you ready? There's a part of each one of you that's been born again that's perfect. It's the Jesus part of you. Because he's perfect. And he's on the inside of me. So there's something living on the inside of me and on the inside of you that are born again that is perfect. Amen? It's perfect. I didn't say I was perfect or you're perfect. I said there's something inside of me that is perfect. I have to rely upon that which is perfect. Instead of, you know, it's kind of like the cartoon. Y'all remember them cartoons? That little angel sitting on one shoulder and it had a, a devil on You have a pitchfork on the other side. Yeah, that's the way it seems sometimes, ain't it? Sometimes when you've got to make a hard decision or you're faced with a, a trial or something, you're, it's like, which voice are you going to hear? <clears throat> Romans 10, 17 says this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So does doubt and fear. Fear comes by hearing and hearing what the enemy has to say. Because Satan is, he can't create anything, but he can replicate or duplicate or try to imitate. Yeah, he's an imposter. Something that the Spirit of God. So Jesus, hallelujah, the angel who sat on his shoulder or whatever said, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So I need to listen to that. But fear comes by hearing, hearing what the enemy has to say about you about your circumstance, about your family, about your kids, about, about your job, about whatever, about your finances. The enemy will get you to believing him so much that you'll fall over into fear. If we're not, because we're crushed, but we're not in despair. Amen. How many knows that every day of our lives we are tested on this word? <clears throat> and so I have to go back to it so many times whether it be open up my Bible or my phone, my Bible app, or what I've hid in my heart. David said, I hide the Word of God in my heart that I may not sin against God. I have to go back to that so many times and say, what did God say? What did God say about my story? When you feel any of these things up here, when you start feeling persecuted and, uh, and struck down and, and all these different things, what did God say about you? Go back to the Word. What does God say? You know, it's been ten and a half months since that happened to me, and I still got a feeding tube, and I know there's people, and thank you, God bless you. But I don't want you feeling sorry for me. Amen? Ain't no, don't feel sorry for Pastor Tim, because I keep going back to the Word, and my Word still says that by His stripes, I'm healed. You may not see it, 
But I'm going to tell you what, it's like this morning. I got more energy than I normally do. And, and Peachy and, and Roger was at the men's conference. I had plenty of energy there, didn't I? Last, last week I was struggling. My wife said, are you sure you're going to be able to go over and pray? I am. Because sometimes the enemy comes and I'll lose a few pounds. I'm only talking three pounds. And it changes my strength level. But uh, I was double fisting it on the way home. We stopped a couple of different times. And uh, she said, well, we need to give you, we need to feed you at least one, one of these things. I said, give me two of them. <laughs> then, and then we went down the road. And we got about to Lebanon, Tennessee. And she, said, she said, I need to feed you again before we get to the house. I said, give me two of them. <laughs> I'm a double portion type of person. <laughs> and I said, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. I weighed more this morning than I've weighed since I got out of the hospital. <clears throat> I'm just, and it ain't because I'm pouring two in there. It's because the Lord is preparing me. Listen to y'all. I'm coming back, and I ain't coming back limping. I'm coming back stronger than I've ever been before. And because I need to be a sign and a wonder for you and for all of you that are watching, that you need to realize you may be struck down, but you're not destroyed. I'm not destroyed. I've got a blessed thing because i got a second chance at life. So I'm going to do all I can do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plummet hell and populate heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm going to jerk them out of the fire. I told them down at the men's conference. Uh, I said, i got to give you a disclaimer before I start. I said, you see this patch on the side of it? Everybody wanted a patch after I told this story. Yeah, this is a Solomon patch. If you haven't wanted, we put a piece of tape on it because when she don't, I lose them. I forget and I scratch my head. Where's your patch at? I don't know. And it's the most expensive medicine I have. So anyway, I got this patch. And so I decided I explained to him because Keith, Pastor Keith had already explained that Pastor Tim has to have a cup because he's not able to swallow or nothing. But this is supposed to cut down the saliva <clears throat> and how much I, and then when it's newer, it cuts it down. It's only every three days I had to change it and change ears. Okay, whatever that means. But I do it. <clears throat> but Pastor Barb got to researching it here a couple months ago. <clears throat> And she found out that this thing is a true serum. It's true serum. That's what that's one of the things that it's useful. And so I told them at the men's conference, I said, I said, listen, guys, I may be blunt and to the point, but I'm wearing true serum today. Serum, yeah, that, thank you. I can't say that word even when I didn't have a <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. That wasn't because of stroke. That was because I was from the mountains. Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. I told him that, and so then Pastor Keith gets up, and he, he releases a word that's pretty strong, and he said, I may have to borrow Pastor Tim's patch. <clears throat> so everybody was wanting my patch after that because it gave him an excuse to speak the truth. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, baby. She said, you've always had the truth serum. I said it right then, didn't I? Yeah, just a little bit more. There's not as much filtering. <clears throat> Hallelujah. That's the reason I can tell you that if, <clears throat> yeah, I know he, don't, he didn't have his a long time ago. <clears throat> That's the reason I can tell you stuff like if the old man is not dead inside of you, you ain't born again. <clears throat> I don't say that to be mean. I say that because I want you to go to heaven. Amen. That's all, it, that's, all that's for. I got to get going. I thought I wasn't going to go long today. <laughs> and you said, I thought you weren't either. Look here, I want to read that same set of scriptures, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9 in the Passion. Because <clears throat> I like what it says. It says, we are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within us so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. In other words, when you're crushed, when you're put down, when you, didn't, you went to this place that the enemies knocked you down and you're still serving God and you're still giving Him glory, I'm going to tell you what, there's more power there. 
There's more power. There's more anointing because you're being crushed. <clears throat> Let me tell you this. I've spoke this out before, but this is something God showed me. Your praise when you're going through your worst times has more value to it than it is when you get to heaven. Because when you get to heaven, everything's going to be okay. And it's easy for us to sing holy, holy, holy. But when you sing it down here and you're going through all kinds of hell and your body don't feel like singing uh, and you, this is going on in your life and your kids is this and your job is that and your finances are this and you don't know which way to turn, your holy, 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 your praise has got more value then. Amen. And I believe, I mean, everybody here is going through something. And this is not, I'm not trying to get us to uh, be hee-haw. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <clears throat> this ain't a hee-haw moment. But what it is is a moment to say, you know what? We're still here. Every one of you. You could have been gone in 2023, but you're still here. You went through a lot of different stuff, and the enemy tried to take you out. Guess what? You're still here. Turn around to somebody and tell them you're still here. And if you're still here, that means God ain't done with you yet. <clears throat> Why? Because this extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. Amen? <clears throat> Though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. <clears throat> Amen? We experience every kind, everybody here has got some kind of pressure on you, but you're not crushed. At times, we don't know what to do. But I love this next part. That's the reason I put it in there. But quitting's not an option. <laughs> quitting ain't an option. The enemy will tell you to quit. Say, won't you just stop it? You ain't doing good. You know, he'll get you to look at your performance. He'll get you to look at, see how many people are coming or how many people you're winning to Jesus or how many people you're praying with. And he'll... He'll focus on that so much, and he'll try to get you to focus on that so much that you just want to quit. Amen? We don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. I've went to doctors uh, of the Western world, and they tell me, said, go back to your therapist. Well, I, my therapist is the only one I trust, and she said, well, what I'm doing is done everything it's going to do. And I'd quit doing therapy two or three months before they told me this. And then they tell me to go back to her. I, said, I was like, I just told Pastor Barb, I said, let's just get out of here. <clears throat> Guess what? Felt like the woman with the issue of blood. Spent all I had and I was none better. <laughs> you know, and I'm not knocking the, the medical world or whatever. But here's the thing. All it did was prove to me the fact that I can't put my faith in modern medicine and doctors. I've got to put it in, keep it in Jesus. Not that it had ever come off of, of, of being in Jesus. I know he was ultimately the way. But here's the thing. I trust him. I trust him. I may not know it. I don't know what to do. And we had all these doctors and therapists and specialists and surgeons. They throw up their hands. And say, we don't know what to do. About two months ago. Or last month, because she got to go to bar and get another one. But anyway, our pharmacist said, you know, your husband, I've never seen, we've never had a patient before have to wear those patches as long as he's had to. That's what the, they're saying. Well, glory to God. It must be because there's somebody else out there that needs to see a miracle when God begins that I don't need this and I jerk it off. Amen. I'm not, I'm not despair. I'm not crushed. Because I know that the process, the process ain't for me. It ain't for her. It ain't probably for you. It's for somebody that I've not come in contact yet with. They're either online or I'm going to go preach it. And it's them that they need to see that Jesus still heals. Jesus still heals. Matter of fact, Friday night I'll be in uh, Owensburg, Kentucky at the hub, the revival hub, uh, speaking, I think, 7 o'clock <clears throat> I was supposed to be the barn out, but I can't be there. But I got too many things going on. But uh, I'll be there. And I've told uh, at, at both congregations, and they did it up in uh, Sevierville, too. They said, I know you can't drink, but do you want some water? And I said, yeah, put a bottle up there by faith. 
This is always on a pulpit by faith because there's going to come a time that I'm just going to pop it open and And I'm not trying to make this about me, but I know what I'm going through. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm going to say this. God's no respecter of persons. If he'll do it for Pastor Tim, he'll do it for you. Because I know me. I ain't been good enough to have a miracle. I ain't read enough to have a miracle. I've not prayed enough to have a miracle. But his grace is sufficient. His grace and his mercy. See, I'm not earning this miracle. And you can't earn yours. But we can trust him to it manifest. Amen. Look here. At times we don't even know what to do. But quitting is not one of them. That's what the enemy wants you to do is quit. He wants you to quit. Look at verse 9. We are per persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but we're not knocked out. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, can you help me with this, babe? I've got, uh, we may want to put me down. <laughs> Thank you. I've got two Coke cans. Y'all see them? Well, <clears throat> thank you for going and get me another. <clears throat> but this one's muddy. It's got a lot of the world on it. It's got a, it's got a lot of the world. It's been rolled around. It's been kicked around. It's been sunk in a lot of mud. But this one's pretty and shiny. In fact, this one's brand new. Kelly went and got it for me this morning. It's brand new. It's washed clean. I'll see the difference. I'm, I'm just getting back here so you can see that. Both of these are vessels, are they not? This can is considered a vessel. Thank you, babe. These cans is considered. You got me a cup? Okay. <laughs> These cans are considered vessels. Did you know that this can that's muddy and it's got a lot of the world attached to it that is just as valuable as this can that's brand new? It is. Yeah. Because the value is not in the vessel. The value is what's inside it. You see that? Whoa. You can tell I ain't poured one in a long time. <laughs> uh, the value is what's inside this can. It's not the can. Now, I know that years ago we had bottles that we'd get a nickel for. Some of you younger folks just look at me like, what? <laughs> Don't they, Brother Mike? Brother Mike knows what I'm talking about. Hey, I collected bottles a lot. I would walk around the ditches to pick up bottles, and I thought, when I'd find a bottle, a nickel, a Dr. Pepper, I'd be like, Woo! Glory! There's a gumball! But, uh, see, the value, back then, the value was in the vessel some, too. But now, and knowing what Jesus has done in us, the value is not in your vessel. The value is what's inside of you. Amen? I don't think I got any mud on it. In it. Yeah. But let me show you something. Uh, I'm probably, let me show you something. Romans 8 5 8. Well, it ain't going. I didn't think I gave him this scripture. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, Christ died for every vessel that's covered with this world. Amen. He died, he died for the muddy, and, and, and that's a, you heard me release this word the other day, that some people don't come to church because of muddy feet, so to speak, but gee, because they've been in the world and they've got out and done things. But yet I find in Scripture where Jesus washes feet. Amen. He, he gets the mud off of him. He said, uh, the true value of a vessel is what's inside. But, I'm going to go back one so I don't, you know, going the wrong way. Yeah, that's it. Colossians 1.27 says, to them God 
will to make known that what is the riches of his glory and the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? The hope of glory lives inside of you. If you've been born again by the Spirit of God and old things have passed away and behold, all things are new, the hope of glory is inside of you. Amen? <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> now, we just read Scripture where I'm pressed on every side and persecuted and said we're not crushed. But just think, that's our vessel, and I'm a storm of life coming along, okay? Here comes a storm of life. Just squashed it, didn't it? But I thought that was a vessel. It's the same kind of vessel as this one. Let's try that again. Here's a clean new one. Because how many knows that old things have passed away? Behold, all things have become new and clean. Look at this. Storm of life's come. I can't do it. I ain't got a balance. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? How come this one is crushed and this one ain't? How come this one didn't fold up under the pressure and that one did? It's because this one's still filled. It's just filled. That one's empty. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God, but not just filled. Because if I had left that one, the, the, uh, the Coke in it, and I got on it after I popped the top, it just squirted out when the pressure came in. So there's two things that need to happen. We need to make sure that we're filled and that we're sealed. Filled and sealed. When you've been filled and sealed by the Spirit of God, then it doesn't matter what the storm comes. They may rage on you. Amen. But God's going to get you out of this thing. Hallelujah. Look here. Let me give you some scripture on it. It says, To them God willed to be known the riches of his glory, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I read that already. Uh, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed from a day of redemption. So it's not just about getting filled. It's about being sealed. Let me explain the difference in that. Have you ever seen somebody and they just go to the altar and they cry and they cry and they cry and they pour it out and they say, oh, I feel better. And it's because they got filled up and they walk out and then two or three weeks later, they're back in the world doing everything they used to do. Did they not get filled? Yeah, they got filled. They just didn't get sealed. You see the difference? Because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. By the blood. Let me read another scripture about being sealed. This is Ephesians 1.13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit don't, don't, not only fills me up, but he seals me tight to where I won't be crushed by this world. Amen? Y'all get that? Sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. That's the reason I brought the cans in today. You got to make sure, not only have I been filled, but I've been sealed by the blood of Jesus, by the, by the uh, Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Matthew 26 says it this way. Uh, 26, 26 through 28. <clears throat> this, is, this is like Jesus doing the, the Lord's Supper. And he said, and, he, and as they ate, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, eat of this. This is my body. Eat, eat it. Then taking the cup of wine and giving praises to the Father, he entered into covenant. That's very important there. You know what a covenant is? A covenant is an agreement that you come into with somebody that you don't break, especially a blood covenant. And blood covenant, you, you remember as a kid, we used to, I didn't really cut myself, but we'd make ourselves bleed and we'd kind of rub it together. <clears throat> we'd say we're blood brothers or whatever. <clears throat> and what we're doing... They would literally make blood covenants back then that they'd hunt you down if you broke the covenant for seven generations. So there's more power to the blood covenant. How many knows that Jesus did the blood covenant with us? He entered into the covenant with them saying, this is my blood. Each of you must drink it in fulfillment of the covenant. Look at this verse. For this is the blood that seals. Everybody say seals. 
that seals the new covenant. It, it will be poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. In other words, this seals the new covenant. What is the new covenant? Hebrews says, I'll give you a better covenant. You could always, you can do it this way. The Old Testament is the Old Covenant. The New Testament is the New Covenant. And it said there's no power to a, uh, to a testament. You know how you do your life's will and testament? There's no power until that person dies, is there? There's no power. It's like my, my parents are both still alive, thank God, and they're going to live a long, long time. But here's the thing. Their last will and testament, there's no power to it till they die. There's no, I don't have one, but if I did have one, there would be no power till I died. There's no power till they died. Guess what? Jesus died. He was rose in the third day, but Jesus died. So there's power in the new covenant. There's power in the new testament because it's a, it's, it's a testimony of, his, of what he's done in his life. Amen. Hallelujah. And Jesus said right here, he said, for this is the blood that seals the new covenant. In other words, the new relationship I have with you. See, the old, old covenant, we had to kill lambs and, and goats and doves and everything like that. But this new covenant, you ain't got to because the precious lamb, the spotless lamb of God, he done laid down on the cross for you and I. Amen. It's done been done. Amen. Is that You understand that. And Jesus said, this is the blood, as it's taken uh, communion, he said, this is the blood that seals the new covenant. <clears throat> this is the blood that seals the new covenant. I will be poured out. So what, now you understand what I mean when I say I've been filled and I've been sealed. I pray you've been filled and you've been sealed. <clears throat> How do you know? Do you run away from the things of God? You ain't been sealed yet. You ain't been sealed because you want to be a part of what God's doing. Amen. So I'm going to encourage you this morning. You must be born again to go into the kingdom of heaven. There's no other way to heaven but by the name of Jesus. Amen. You must be born again. All things must pass away and behold, all things become new. How do they become new? When I get filled with him, and then he seals me with his blood or the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. You've been listening to Sermons from the Well with Pastor Tim Rigdon. Subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get fresh new weekly episodes. For more, please visit our website at www.thewell.live. Until next time, come as you are. You won't leave the same.